All right, so the setting for this talk is uh, encrypted outsourced storage. So imagine you have a client that has some key that I've denoted here by K1, and it encrypts uh, large volumes of data, a bunch of messages, uh, before uh, uploading them to some outsourced uh, storage service, perhaps a, a cloud service or some backup. Uh, and because we're using encryption, we're worried about confidentiality, particularly of our messages. Uh, and so we don't want to trust uh, the encryption keys uh, or other information that can be used to derive message data uh, to the storage service. But we do trust the storage service to store our data for us. One thing that we would like in these settings is the ability to do key rotation. So given uh, our key K1, we can generate a new key K2 for a second time period, uh, take all of our ciphertext encrypted under K1 and somehow convert them to ciphertexts, uh, which are encryptions of the messages under the new key, K2. So key rotation turns out to be a pretty uh, important property in practice, uh, most pragmatically because there's a variety of regulatory uh, regulations that require uh, periodic key rotations. So in the credit card industry, uh, the PCI DSS uh, standard you know, requires this, say, for encrypting credit card data. Uh, more generally, you might want this in the context of post-compromise cleanup if K1 was uh, ex uh, exfiltrated or you had concern that it might have been exfiltrated at some point, uh, you'd like to rotate to new keys. Um, and there's plenty of other uh, good reasons why key rotation is important. So much so that uh, major companies, when they build like, encryption APIs for uh, their customers, include key rotation uh, functionality and workflows specifically to support doing this efficiently. So how do we do uh, key rotation? Well, there's a, a couple obvious but unsatisfying approaches, right? The first and most obvious is just to send both keys K1 and K2 up to the storage service. They can decrypt and re-encrypt stuff. This isn't satisfying because obviously we've exposed the keys to uh, a, a location where we would like, not like it to, to be exposed to. Second trivial approach is just download all the ciphertext and do the re-encryption locally on the client. But there's this obvious performance uh, concern that if you have large amounts of data, say terabytes of data, this is going to be prohibitively expensive in terms of performance. So in practice, what people do is uh, use what we'll call the authenticated encryption, or AE hybrid approach. And uh, that just means that we're going to have a encryption that's like two parts, right? The first part is going to be an encryption under K1 of a data encryption key uh, that we'll label as X. And the second portion will be an encryption of the message under X. So sometimes we refer to these as key encapsulation mechanisms and data encapsulation mechanisms, or chem-dem style constructions. So this is nice uh, because when you want to do a rotation, then you can just do a rotation uh, by re-encrypting X. So you choose a new key K2. You just go fetch this short uh, header, uh, this chem uh, ciphertext C1 star, and then decrypt that and then re-encrypt uh, under the new key K2. And this is indeed what's uh, being offered right now uh, by uh, these APIs I mentioned earlier. But this is ultimately a little bit uh, unsatisfying. Um, in particular, the data encryption key X never changes. And when I first started thinking about this problem, it was actually because an Amazon engineer came and said, hey, it's a little bit weird that we have these key rotations that aren't actually rotating all of the secrets underlying the ciphertext. So motivated by that same, I think, observation, uh, there's a nice prior work by Bonet Louis Montgomery and Raghunathan, uh, or I'll refer to them as BLMR, and they introduced this idea of updatable encryption to try to, uh, or to uh, achieve this type of key rotation where all secrets are changed. So they also use a chem-dem style construction uh, where they have an encryption of a dem key under uh, using some kind of standard symmetric encryption. But then the data encapsulation portion is a little bit unique. They use what's called a key homomorphic PRG, uh, or pseudorandom generator, that has some special properties. So G takes a, a seed X uh, and maps it to a, a group element in a way that uh, has this additional homomorphism property that you can take G of X plus G of X prime for some other seed X prime, and this is equal to G of X, X or X prime. And in turn, you can build these from uh, key homomorphic PRFs. And in fact, the, the BLMR paper was primarily about how to build uh, key homomorphic PRFs in, in the standard model. Um, and this was, the updatable encryption was just like one component of that uh, much broader paper. So to do a rotation now, we can do something interesting, which is that you get back this type of header C1 star. You can use that to recover X. You can sample a new uh, data encapsula encapsulation key X prime. Uh, 
and then send back to the server now uh, a new header C2 star plus this delta token, which is the XOR of X, XOR of X prime. And the server can then uh, kind of rotate the data encapsulation key by adding to the portion of the ciphertext C1 this G of delta. And by applying the homomorphism property, you see that C1, this uh, is plus G of delta, is indeed equal to G of X prime plus M. And so we've effectively rotated all the secrets. So uh, that's nice, refreshes everything. It has low bandwidth cost because C1 star and C2 star and delta are compact. Uh, but it requires quite a number of exponentiations uh, because you're using uh, like asymmetric uh, crypto uh, mechanisms underneath these key homomorphic PRG. And I should mention also that they focus primarily on IND CPA style encryption, so they weren't worried about authentication or C text. And so uh, they're just using IND CPA encryption for this. This will be uh, important in a few minutes. So, the status before our work on um, uh, key rotation uh, is that uh, we have these naive schemes that are ultimately unsatisfying. We have uh, a scheme that's used in practice that has had no formal security analysis, and it's not exactly clear what security this achieves. And in particular, it's not uh, really, it wasn't really clear what uh, we forego by not having complete rotation, like what type of uh, attacks uh, arise because of this. And then we had this nice work by BLMR15 that uh, targeted uh, chosen plain text attack security, and they provided a, a notion of IND CPA that uh, lifts IND CPA to this uh, key rotation setting, and also a, a notion of ciphertext independence that I won't go into too much details on, but tries to capture this idea that you're refreshing all the secrets. So we looked at this and saw, well, one, it's clear that we can probably achieve stronger security notions than what they are achieving. Uh, we wanted to uh, also treat authentication, so we need in practice authentication encryption, not just IDCPA security. Uh, and um, there was also a subtle bug in the proof sketch of, of, of IDCPA from the BLMR15 scheme that I just showed, and so we wanted to fix that as well. And finally, there's a question of whether these schemes that use uh, kind of more expensive operations can be made practical, or is this really going to be too prohibitive in practice? So in our work, we uh, uh, give a treatment of uh, key rotation for symmetric encryption, including authentic encryption, and introduce three new security notions. An up IND notion that's stronger than uh, BLMR15s, uh, a CTEX notion that captures authenticity goals in this setting, and then a uh, so-called re-encryption indistinguishability notion that is, in our, uh, our belief, is a bit more intuitive than the ciphertext independence notion, and it also captures a much broader class of attacks. And then we use this to analyze both old and new schemes and perhaps most noticeably introduce two new schemes, uh, one uh, called KSS that doesn't achieve up re-encrypt security but is very fast, and another recrypt, which is a uh, variant of the BLMR scheme that uh, repairs the issues from before but also extends it to meet our stronger security goals. Now, sort of embarrassingly, uh, just last week, uh, Joseph Yeager found a bug in some of our proofs for uh, up ctext, and this actually invalidates um, the uh, security uh, of the schemes for KSS recrypt as in the context of ctext uh, as given in the camera ready. So that's kind of a bummer, but Joseph was very nice to point this out to us. Uh, we've, we have fixes for the schemes and are working on a write-up. Qualitatively, it shouldn't change the uh, uh, result takeaways um, from the paper, uh, but we'll be putting that up on ePrint uh, very shortly. And for that reason, uh, I'll be focusing just on the uh, uh, CPA uh, kind of portions <laughs> of, of uh, our work. Uh, yeah, didn't mean that to be a joke, but I can see why that's funny. Um, <laughs> and, and also because I didn't have time. That's the real reason, yeah. Okay, so uh, we'll go through these each in turn. So to fix some uh, notation, uh, an updatable AE scheme is, is, you know, combines the basic three algorithms that we're used to, key generation, encryption, decryption, with a re-key generation uh, algorithm that takes two keys, ki, kj, and a ciphertext header, ci uh, star, and then generates a new, an update token. That can then be in turn used with a re-encryption algorithm to uh, rotate the key underlying a ciphertext. And this kind of gives us the, the right uh, syntax semantics, um, and I should say this is building off the BLMR uh, formalization as well. So you can encrypt something, you can generate a re-key token using it, uh, use re-encryption, and then successfully decrypt the uh, resulting ciphertext under the key to which it was rotated. And we have a formalized correctness conditions for all this in the paper. In terms of confidentiality, we introduce a, a new kind of class of definitions, all based on a, a relatively complicated, uh, at least looking, uh, security game called UpIND. 
This is a kind of left or right indistinguishability uh, notion for chosen plain text attacks. Uh, we generate a bunch of different keys. Uh, in fact, there's two sets of keys, ones that are going to be uncompromised and then ones that are actually explicitly handed over directly to the attacker. And then the goal of the adversary is to you know, query a challenge LR oracle here at the bottom uh, with two messages uh, to one of the uh, uh, uncompromised keys and get back an encryption of one of the two messages chosen at random uh, and try to figure out what this bit B is. The, additionally, the adversary has access to all these other oracles, like a regular encryption oracle to get examples of encryptions that aren't uh, challenge encryptions, rekey generation, and re-encryptions. Now, we have to be very careful here to avoid trivial wins, right? If you query the LR oracle on an uncompromised key, but then immediately you can go get a re-encryption of that ciphertext to a compromised key, one of these ones that's handed to the adversary directly, there's going to be a problem, right? You're going to win trivially. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out exactly how to uh, formalize what are valid and invalid uh, queries that should be allowed to rekey gen and re-encrypt. And so we give these predicates, these invalidity predicates that define exactly that. And we spent a lot of time trying to make the most permissive uh, invalidity predicates that we could come up with. The uh, BLMR confidentiality notion actually ends up being captured in this framework. We just have much stricter invalidity procedures that rule out any queries to compromised keys. And additionally, uh, doesn't, they don't return uh, a ciphertext header on an invalid um, re-encryption query. Uh, this last thing turns out to be something that was kind of interesting to us because it surfaced a compromise scenario that we hadn't uh, thought of before and in fact um, allowed showing that in our model at least things like a hybrid don't even meet this uh, up IND security notion. So let me just go over that very briefly. So remember our hybrid is just this chem dem thing where we encrypted a, a data encapsulation key X under uh, our key K and then the message under X. And in this context our adversary can uh, do the following. Query the left-right uh, oracle to get a challenge ciphertext. Query a uh, re-encryption now to re-encrypt this ciphertext to a compromised key, so T plus one. So this is one of the ones that's given to the attacker. And at this point, uh, the invalidity procedure will say, oh, this is kind of an invalid query because you're rotating a challenge ciphertext to a, a compromised key. But because we're uh, being very permissive, we're going to give back uh, the header C, in this case, C T plus one star. OK, but that's just an encryption under k t plus 1 in, for this scheme of x. And so uh, we have the key there. So we can just decrypt and get back x and then uh, recover uh, from c1 uh, m sub b and win there. So this ends up being a sort of uh, perhaps in practice esoteric compromise setting because you need a, a certain combination of values. But it was interesting to us that this got surfaced from uh, exploring these definitions formally. And it turns out that we can actually achieve this uh, security, achieve security and avoid these types of attacks by a pretty simple change to AE hybrid. So the, that, that change is what we call a chem dem with secret sharing. The basic problem with the uh, uh, security uh, in our model from before is that you, if you get this compromised header, a uh, header for a compromised key, that's enough to reveal the data encapsulation key completely. And so what we can do is uh, prevent that by doing a kind of secret share of the data encapsulation key across the two portions of the ciphertext. So now we sample an X and a Y. Uh, we store inside the key encapsulation an X, X or Y, and store Y with the other portion of the ciphertext. And this is just, a, like I said, a simple secret sharing scheme. When we do rekey generation, we can uh, get back the header, uh, decrypt it to get back this X or X, X or Y, we can sample new Y prime, kind of refresh the secret share by XORing Y prime into X, sending Y prime as well over to the uh, storage service and refreshing on that side as well. So it turns out we can prove uh, that this is uh, up IND secure, and it really has a very small overhead uh, compared to A hybrid. It's just the addition of these uh, small XORs that are, you know, say 128 bits. But note that uh, the data encryption key here is still never rotated, okay? So we're still kind of in the same fundamental place that uh, uh, X is, is never rotated. And this begs the question of what um, we're giving up, basically, by having schemes that, say, are just up IND secure um, and not refreshing all the secrets underlying ciphertext. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what are interesting uh, attack models that can take advantage of this lack of refresh of the data encapsulation key. It wasn't at all clear to begin with. 
And we came up with a few different things, and I'll explain just one exfiltration attack scenario that seems to be important uh, for this property. So imagine you have in a time period one, and we'll just do this in the context of a hybrid, it's a little bit simpler, but the same uh, thing applies to KSS. Uh, in the first time period, the attacker, say, compromises both, uh, gets access to both K1 as well as a full ciphertext. And at this point, perhaps because he's under, in this uh, time period, some type of uh, constraints about how much data he can exfiltrate, he can't exfiltrate the whole message, but he can get out some small secret, that allows him to uh, output the uh, data encapsulation key X. And then later, if we do a rotation, say cleaning up after that compromise uh, and moving to a new key K2, and the adversary later on gets access now just to the ciphertext, but not K2, we've done better jobs securing our key K2. Uh, nevertheless, this X value is still enough to, to recover the message, right? Because we haven't rotated that uh, key. So this type of, uh, we'd like to have security models that deal with this type of attacks as well. And so we introduce this uh, re-encryption indistinguishability notion that speaks to it. And it's basically a strengthening of, uh, or it's stronger than the ciphertext independence notion um, from the LMR. And I'll just again give some intuition about why, um, what, it, uh, what it's uh, doing for us. So it's again used, using some type of game to uh, formalize security. And instead of having left or right uh, challenge oracle that you query two different messages to, we're going to have a left or right re-encryption oracle that we can query two different ciphertexts to. And the idea is that the attacker shouldn't be able to tell which of the two ciphertexts was actually re-encrypted. Okay? The intuition for why this is, and we have all the same problems, the invalidity predicates, and there's other oracles which I'm not showing here, the re-key generation and re-encryption and encryption stuff. So the intuition is that basically we want to capture an idea in, in which I don't know what that was, uh, in which uh, the ciphertext basically from one time period is useless to an attacker in a ne the next time period. And this captures that um, because the attacker can't even tell which ciphertext was used um, from one period uh, in the rotation. And in particular, it rules out these exfiltration attacks. So the question is, can we uh, then you know, achieve both up IND security as well as this up re-encryption uh, security? And the natural starting point for that is the, the BLMR scheme that uses this key homomorphic PRG. But as I mentioned uh, briefly before, there's a, a bug in the proof, and it turns out it's not even up IND CPA. And this turns out to be uh, somewhat easy to fix, but technically it was kind of interesting understanding this bug, so let me go over it uh, very quickly. Um, so recall the BLMR schemes unprovable, uh, the BLMR schemes uh, secure, uh, scheme is using this CAMDEM uh, style thing with this key homomorphic PRG. And this allows updates by exploiting the homomorphism properties of the uh, PRG. As uh, they put in their paper, uh, basically a theorem that you know, a high level is saying that you know, if E, the uh, chem uh, encryption, is IND CPA and G is a secure PRG, then the scheme is, it meets this up IND CPA security. So it turns out this is problematic, um, in particular because uh, in the security games, both in their paper and, and in ours, uh, the adversary gets access to rekey generation oracles, um, which means that in particular they can mount a kind of chosen ciphertext attack uh, against the underlying chem encryption E. And so uh, INDCPA doesn't seem like it should be enough uh, to prove security. So that was easy to understand, but trying to figure out whether this is actually insecure took a lot of work. And instead, we weren't able to come up with a direct attack showing that uh, this is insecure. Um, for some instantiation of E, but what we were able to show is a relativized result that uh, if you could give a proof of this uh, up IND CPA security just from the IND CPA security of E, then this would imply a proof that uh, this particular construction E is, its IND CPA security implies that it's actually circular secure. There's been a long line of work on circular security and showing like negative results about INDCPA implying uh, circular security. Those don't directly apply because we have a very special form of, the cons of, of, of E in our result. But nevertheless, it seems like a lot of evidence that you're not going to be able to prove something uh, strong here. OK, so the, uh, it's easy to fix up that one issue because we can replace INDCPA chems with uh, an authenticated encryption scheme. Um, and in addition, we add other uh, features to the BLMR scheme to uh, arrive at uh, this uh, recrypt scheme that achieves uh, our stronger security goals as well. So the AE, uh, using AE uh, for the uh, CAM prevents this type of mauling issue that uh, came up in the proof, or the attempted proof of the previous BLMR scheme. 
Um, we also do the same type of technique as we did for KSS, which is the secret share, the, the data encapsulation key across the two components of the uh, ciphertext. And when we do a refresh, we now need to not only refresh the uh, key X prime, uh, the key X, but also the secret share um, uh, Y. So I won't go into details, but it turns out we can show that this is both up IND and up re-encrypt security. So in, in uh, words, this means that we get this stronger confidentiality, uh, even with access to these re-key gen and re-encryption oracles, and that the ciphertext um, in a similar kind of attack setting is basically useless. Uh, ciphertext from one time period under one key are kind of useless to attackers moving forward. So you get this very full um, um, security. So finally, the last question that I had was whether uh, we can make these things performant enough in practice. We did uh, a bunch of work to implement uh, uh, Recrypt in a um, uh, highly you know, optimized way. Uh, we used uh, underlying it the Nauer Pinkett's Rheingold uh, key homomorphic PRF, which is this like uh, random oracle model um, construction that also uh, uses a DDH hard group. Uh, for that, we used a curve 25519. Put together, this basically allows us to uh, encrypt Lbit messages in requiring roughly about L over 248 exponentiations. Um, and rotation requires about the same. So the high level takeaway is this is uh, by symmetric encryption standards excruciatingly incru slow. Uh, and it's about a thousand times slower than the uh, use of like uh, AASNI with ASGCM, which is what you can standard uh, um, instantiate a hybrid or KSS with. So for short messages, this is, you know, you can still do this in uh, um, micro, uh, milliseconds, but uh, for large bulk data, this uh, seems uh, prohibitive at this point. Um, and it's kind of a cool open question whether this is kind of fundamental to get this key rotation property. You really need algebraic properties, and we can prove uh, that uh, you can't do better. Um, or maybe if not, then we can come up with something a bit faster. OK, so to summarize, uh, we provided a formal treatment uh, in depth of key rotation for symmetric encryption. Um, we introduced a bunch of new security notions that strengthen on the prior work and uh, investigated uh, these uh, using a bunch of new and old schemes. Um, and the high level takeaways, those are fast and the other ones are slow. Um, and uh, finally, we have this uh, embarrassing bug uh, in our C-text of proofs. And so please stay tuned for a fix to that, which we'll be posting shortly. Thank you very much. <laughs>